Um, Globally Connected at FIT is our series of 45 minute long virtual discussions led by students, faculty and alumni uh, with open formats to advance global education at FIT in our new world. I am Helen Gaudet. I'm the Assistant Dean for International Education in the Office of International Programs at FIT. And Alexander Nagel, FIT professor in the History of Art Department, he and I have worked together with the Cultural Fellows to put this series together. The major themes of Globally Connected at FIT are fashion, art, sustainability, racial equity, and life in the pandemic around the world. And it's sponsored by the Office of International Programs, the History of Art Department, and the Cultural Fellows Program. So a big welcome to Uni and Mark. Dr. Uni Kawamura earned her PhD in sociology from Columbia University and is trained as a professional designer at Bunka College of Fashion in Japan, Kingston University in the UK, and FIT. She is the author of The Japanese Revolution in Paris Fashion in 2004, and Fashioning Japanese Subcultures in 2012. She is a board member of the International Fashion Research Center at Bologna University, and she has been invited to teach a class on fashion communication to master's students in the School of Design at Politecnico di Milano during the fall 2020 semester. Her research interests include fashion theory, French haute couture, youth subcultures, ethnic dress, and indigenous needlework. She is currently working on two books, The Exclusive World of Geisha and Maiko in Contemporary Japan, and Fashion and Sustainability in New York. Dr. Jungwon Mark Dejong is Associate Professor of Sociology in the Social Sciences Department at, at FIT. He was born in Seoul, South Korea, grew up in the Netherlands, and ended up in New York City in August 2009 after working and studying in London and Los Angeles for over a decade. In addition to cultural appropriation and entertainment, he conducts research and teaches courses in digital sociology, criminology, and East Asian global pop culture production. Dr. De Jong holds a master's degree in American studies from the University of Amsterdam and the University of London School of Advanced Studies and a master's and PhD in sociology from the University of Southern California. Their talk today is titled Cultural Appropriation in Fashion and Entertainment. A big welcome again to Uni and Mark. Thank you so much for giving us this presentation. Thank you. The slides, okay. Okay, um, hi everyone. My name is Yuni Kawamura. I'm actually connecting from um, Japan right now. So um, thank you so much to uh, Alex and uh, Helen for inviting us to, to this event. Um, we are so um, happy to share our research topic on cultural appropriation. So to begin, I'm talking about cultural appropriation in the fashion industry. Uh, since our time is quite limited, uh, it's going to be quite brief, but um, there are so many uh, examples and case studies of cultural appropriation in the industry right now. Um, I'm going to, I've decided to talk about uh, the one that I know best, which is uh, Japanese kimono and uh, geisha. And here uh, I picked some quotes from um, fashion scholars that talked about uh, cultural borrowing to show that uh, cultural appropriation or cultural borrowing is not exactly a new phenomenon. Uh, creators and designers have always you know, used um, ideas from the East, Japan especially, so it's not exactly a new phenomenon, but they, they didn't use the term cultural appropriation. It was more about cultural inspiration. And as early as 1906, as you can see here by Zimmel, uh, Georg Zimmel is a German sociologist who has an article on fashion, and he wrote, the appreciation of foreignness restricted, is restricted to and is a product of higher civilization, which means the adoption of anything foreign is, is or was a status symbol because it was so difficult for people to, um, to get, get or collect ideas from other countries at the time. So it was a status symbol. 
which is a bit different uh, from today. In 1858, Japan opened its to the West and um, started to westernize the country and modernize the country. Before that, for 250 years, Japan was close to the outside world, socially, economically, and politically. And what's so ironic about uh, its isolation is that Japan was most prosperous during these 250 years when the country was completely closed. So after 1858, European merchants began to come to Japan, visit Japan, and saw things that they had never seen before. And they, they bought artifacts, um, artworks, paintings, and kimono. And this is the first time that Japan started to export kimono to the West. And you see painters who are very much inspired by kimono. So they put kimonos on their, their women, on female models, and started painting them. And you see some names here like William Merritt uh, Chase or Alfred Stevenson. If you research them, they have a, a lot of paintings on kimono, not just a couple, but a lot of them. And even the designers, you see the designers and couturiers at the turn of the century, uh, like Paul Poiré, uh, Madeleine Vionnet, Charles Frederick Worth, uh, they are very much inspired by kimono. Kimono is asymmetrical, very loose fitting. Yeah, if you um, look for the distinct features of kimono and geisha style, they are very different from Western fashion, Western clothing. You look at the silhouette, it's very, um, it uses straight lines. And if you put it you know, on the table, it's very flat. It's not three-dimensional. It becomes three-dimensional when a person wears it. And you cut the pieces into rectangular um, shapes, and you stitch them together, and it becomes a kimono. So the structure seems very simple. But how to wear it is very complex. So people think, a lot of Westerners think that when look at the kimono, oh, it's such a simple dress. But what's so complex about kimono is how you actually put it on. And today, you know, for the younger generation kids, they, it's so difficult that they don't know how to put it on. They have to take a lesson to put it on. And if you know how to wear a kimono, in fact, it's something that you can actually brag about. That's how complex it is. Yeah. And um, as far as the designs, design and print motifs are concerned, um, things that are, are very distinctly Japanese are, for instance, like, um, you know, Mount Fuji, cherry blossoms, chrysanthemums, or carps. They are very distinctively Japanese, and a lot of designers and couturiers actually can uh, use these motifs in their, in their uh, fabric print. And adornment styles, you know, for geisha ladies, they always have a fan. A fan is a symbol of Japanese culture, especially geisha culture. And they have all these sticks, you know, uh, hair accessories in their head. That's also very distinct. And makeup. Paint, I'm sure many of you know this, you know, painting your face um, white is very uh, distinct to the geisha. And kimono just continue to fascinate the West. Uh, all these museums in, the, in Europe or in the U.S., United States, they often have exhibitions on kimono or kimono-inspired Western fashion. And designers always adopt ideas from geisha culture and kimono. And geisha and kimono, kimono are, um, are very uh, um, connected together because kimono is almost like geisha's you know, uniform. When they're working as geisha, they have to wear kimono, even in contemporary Japan. I would like to uh, introduce to you some of the case studies, examples that were accused of cultural appropriation of kimono or Japanese uh, geisha culture. And I think many of you are familiar with this example. Uh, this is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. You see the painting on the left. This is Claude Monet. Uh, he painted his wife wearing kimono, and this kimono is called uchikake, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's not an ordinary kimono. 
it's a kimono, uh, it's a special kimono worn at a wedding. So she's wearing this kimono and um, carrying a fan. And the museum had this project or program every Wednesday, and they called it Claude Monet Flirting with the Exotic. And they invited uh, visitors every Wednesday night to wear this kimono replica. And even with a fan, the exact same fan that uh, Madame Monet has, and pose just like her and take pictures, take selfies and put it on Instagram. And it's good for the museums in the promotion as well. And this became a problem. A group of Asian um, protesters uh, came to the museum when they're doing this and they had posted, they were holding up the posters and said, you know, this is racial. To say, to use the word even the exotic is racial, is colonial, it's insulting. They should stop doing this. And the museum came out and said, you know, they never realized that this was cultural appropriation. You know, they're sorry if they ever offended anyone. And they decided to cancel this project, you know, every Wednesday night. This is another example. Um, this was a diversity issue. This issue was called diversity um, from Vogue, a March 2017 issue. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but this is Carly Kloss, the model. Uh, she is dressed like a geisha. As you can see, the, the hairdo is geisha. She's wearing a kimono. And the criticism was that it, some said this is just like black face. You're putting a white model in a geisha style, and she's made to act like a Japanese woman. And they call this diversity issue. Some questioned, is it Vogue's interpretation of diversity? And this is yellow face. It's not black face, but this is yellow face. Uh, this is John Galliano. Um, when he was designing for Christian Dior Auto Couture 2007. Uh, at the time, people weren't exactly say, talking about cultural appropriation, but these days, you know, everyone's like starting to dig up some previous examples and case studies and collections. And they're now saying, and, you know, look at John Galliano's Auto Couture um, collection back in 2007. This is cultural appropriation. He's stealing ideas from the geisha culture. And from the Japanese perspective, uh, yeah, he does take some elements of the geisha culture, especially the hairstyle and the, the, the white face. But in kimono, you never show your skin. So he's exposing a lot of skin there. So it is exactly geisha. It depends on one's perspective. What Personally, what I find offensive in these three pictures is the one on the right, this uh, exagger exaggerated sl uh, slant, slant slitty eyes. That's always uh, offensive for for Asians. And this is excuse me. This is Victoria's Secret um, Go East collection. This was part of Go East collection called Sexy Little Geisha, and in the ad it said your ticket to an exotic adventure. You know, what's so gay about it? The fan, of course, the sticks in the head, um, a sash around the waist is very kimono, and the print is very Japanese. But the fact that this is a lingerie collection, it's reducing Japanese culture to a stereotype of um, exotic sexuality. This is racial fetishism, as some would. A very strong statement. So, I just showed you four examples. Of course, there's you know many, many more. Um, but what's acceptable or unacceptable? Which image is acceptable, unacceptable? Is very tricky. It really depends on whom you ask and in which context 
these images are displayed in. How do we know what we know? How do you decide what is offensive or not offensive? And how is that notion and perception produced? And that really depends on one's standpoint, perspective, your background, or even your upbringing. This is not Japanese kimono, it's Chinese um, chansam chipao. But I wanted to show this image to you because I think this applies to Japanese kimono as well. I'm sure you're familiar with this incident. Uh, when I saw this, I thought, okay, all these debates and discussions that we are hearing coming out of the industry is now expanding to the general public, to the consumer's level. Whether it's good or bad, that's a different story. Uh, this is an American girl in Utah. She was shopping around for her prom dress, and uh, she found this you know, Chinese, beautiful Chinese dress at a secondhand store. She loved it. She bought it, she wore it, took pictures and put it on Instagram. It made some Chinese students really angry. And I picked one of them, I put it here. He makes a very strong statement here. My culture is not your goddamn prom dress. I'm proud of my culture, including the extreme barriers marginalized people within that culture had had to overcome. For it to simply be subject to American consumerism and cater to a white audience is parallel to colonial ideology. I've shown this image to Chinese students in China, from China, and you'd be surprised to know that they have a completely different perspective on this. And they really don't understand why this Chinese American student is so upset. And the Chinese students from China said to me, you know, this American girl liked the dress, this Chinese dress. We are flattered. It means she's interested in Chinese culture. She's interested in Chinese jibao. We love that. Thank you so much. That's what, you know, they want to say. But that's not what you find among Chinese American students. It's completely different. And if this was a Japanese kimono, I think the outcome would be the same. Whether you ask Japanese students from Japan, born and raised in Japan, and you ask Japanese Americans in the US, they have completely opposite perspectives. Japanese Americans in the US were um, arrested and put into concentration camps during the Second World War. They understand the meaning of oppression, suppression. They understand colonial ideology. But Japanese in Japan, Chinese in China, they are not marginalized people, they are mainstream. So they're, they're completely different. They're almost like different racial groups, if you ask me. So it really depends on one's perspective, but we do live in a socially con conscious society. So I think we do need to understand when some people do get upset and offended. And I feel that we need to listen to each voice in a metaphorical sense. So this is Valentino's Conrose then you need to talk to people in the black culture. Gucci using turbans inspired by a Sikh community in India. We need to listen to their voices. Then the one on the right, uh, this is Jean-Paul Gaultier, a French designer inspired by um, Orthodox Jewish people. And this was 1993, this is Jean-Paul Gaultier's black and white picture. But I, this, I think this picture always intrigues me. I don't know much about Orthodox Judaism, but I do want to listen to their voices. I wanted to know what they think about this collection, Gaultier's collection back in the 90s. So I actually Googled and looked for someone who might know. And I found this professor, Zalman uh, Newfield, 
a sociologist, uh, um, graduate of NYU, and he teaches at Borough of uh, Manhattan Community College. And uh, he has this book, interesting book that just came out in spring, Degrees of Separation, Identity Formation While Leaving Ultra-Orthodox Judaism. And he used to be a member of this community and he left. And when I contacted him, he thought, you know, he doesn't know anything about fashion. So he wasn't, he didn't understand why I contacted him. But then, you know, I met him, you know, remotely a couple of days ago because I wanted to invite him to my class. And he understood why I was interested in his book. He does have some sections on dress, dress code. And their clothes is a very important part of their identity. And he knows it. He used to wear it and he got rid of it. So when I showed this picture and I asked him, you know, please, you know, talk about this when you come to my class, his first reaction was, whoa. That was his reaction when he saw this image. And I really want to hear his voice. So I'm actually um, uh, telling the audience, if you're interested in you know, coming to my class, it's next Wednesday at 2. I uh, invited uh, Professor Newfield to my class. So it's brief, but you know, Mark is going to talk about entertainment as well. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about cultural appropriation in entertainment. Um, and I'll, I'll try to condense it um, a little bit. So um, uh, hopefully I'll, uh, I'll just pick out the most, most interesting parts. Uh, if you go back in history, I think what is really interesting um, is that it, it seems that today um, everyone is talking about cultural appropriation and entertainment as if it's a 21st century phenomenon. But if you actually go back in time, if you go back in history, not just to uh, the the 21st century, uh, the 20th century, but also even in uh, the 90th century, you'll find that concerns about the commodification and appropriation of culture in entertainment um, in, well, not in the 19th century, there was no television, but in film, theater, music, uh, literature has always existed. Um, and um, I, I obviously won't go all the way back to um, the 19th century, but to give you uh, just some examples, to give you some highlights of some of the concerns that were expressed way, way back. Um, for instance, uh, Langston Hughes very uh, famously published a poem, uh, Notes on Commercial Theater in 1940. And in this poem, he criticized uh, artists, uh, predominantly white artists who absorbed, he called it, African-American culture. And it started during the Harlem Renaissance when everyone showed an interest in African-American culture. And um, I will quote just a, a little bit from the, uh, the poem uh, you wrote in the article. You've taken my blues and gone, you sing them on Broadway and you sing them in the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles. And you mix them up with symphonies and you fix them so they don't sound like me. Uh, what is really interesting is that since then, since 1940, um, Langston Hughes' concerns have come true multiple times. Uh, most recently in 2019, when the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences made uh, the rather controversial decision to exclude African-American um, blues guitarist um, Chris Thomas King's album, Hotel Fudu, from consideration for the contemporary blues album category because it had um, some songs that featured a clarinet. And the National Academy, um, or rather the committee in charge of the blues categories did not consider the album to be authentically blues enough. And so when Chris Thomas King found out uh, that he was uh, excluded, not only that he was excluded, but also that he was uh, that there was only one African-American artist among the nominees in the contemporary blues category and that the other artists were all um, Caucasian, uh, he was furious and he wrote an article in the British magazine, The Spectator, and this is a quote. Uh, he wrote, in 2018, African-Americans can be banished from participating in their own music. It is incredible that I've been forced out of the blues to make room for Mick Jagger, a billionaire Englishman, and his Rolling Stones. And I think it's a very telling quote because it also 
um, says a lot about the whole idea of cultural authenticity and music genres. And it, it was for him um, a really defining moment that he, not that he wasn't necessarily nominated, but the fact that he wasn't allowed to submit his album for nomination because it wasn't considered to be authentic enough. Um, and just to summarize the remainder of the 20th century and the first two decades of the 21st century was some notable cultural appropriation highlights in entertainment before I will get to my main points. Um, and, and this will be rather brief, so I'll, I'll go through it um, as, as if it's a timeline. Uh, we'll, we have Public Enemy, right, calling Elvis Presley and John Wayne racist and the now classic 1989 hip hop anthem, Fight the Power, that was used in Spike Lee's movie. Um, as well, Fight the Power, we, um, to quote a line from a 1993 New York Times article written by Jesse Green, um, there is the Paris is no longer burning, it has burned controversy, which uh, addresses the alleged appropriation, but particularly uh, the ex exploitation of African American and Latinx ballroom culture. Uh, in the aftermath of the success of Jenny Livingston's 1990 documentary, Paris is Burning, which turned out to be pretty successful in the mainstream and which established um, the foundation for the RuPaul Drag Race um, kind of franchise for series like Pose and for everyone who afterwards used words like shade and shady and reading and fierce. Um, there is a face off. Uh, depending on who you will ask, there is a little bit of a debate, but uh, between what would become the very first rap single to hit number one in the Billboard Hot 100s, is it Blondie's 1981 Rapture, which in all honesty only contains a rap verse, so it's not really a rap single, but it has a rap verse, um, or is it Vanilla Ice's 1999 Ice Ice Baby? Either way, um, both bands, um, mostly consists of, I think, or probably only consists of members that were not part of the communities that actually originated um, rap music and rap culture, um, which were the African-American and Latinx communities on the East Coast. Uh, the second rap single um, that made it to number one also uh, uh, in 19, uh, that was actually in, um, no, in 2000 and, one, um, that was Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch, uh, which is very interesting um, because uh, they were also not representative of the diversity that uh, originated rap music. And it wasn't until PM Dawn set adrift the memory bliss um, that this diversity was actually represented um, in the charts. Um, just to complicate discussions about cultural appropriation a little bit, because we tend to focus on it um, predominantly from a majority versus minority perspective. Um, but uh, in the early 2000s, uh, the hip hop community didn't necessarily um, get away scot-free. Um, Dr. Dre's record label Interscope, the producer DJ Quick and the artist Truth Hurts were accused of cultural imperialism and they were sued for half a billion dollars by uh, Calcutta's Sargama India Limited and the composer Babi Lahiri for using a sample of the Bollywood song, and I apologize, I will not pronounce it correctly, uh, Toda Resham Lakta Hai um, in Truth Hurts 2002 Addicted. And despite it being sung by one of the most recorded voices in the world at the time, and that was in 2002, uh, by the legendary Lata Mangeshkar, and despite the Bollywood film industry already being among the largest, if not the largest in the world in 2002, Dr. Dre claimed that he had been unable to locate the original copyright holders of the song, which is uh, almost akin to saying, I'm sorry, but um, I sampled the Michael Jackson song without securing copyright license because um, I was unable to locate original copyright holders. So hence the cultural imperialist claim that was targeted towards Dr. Dre and his record label. So when it comes to um, cultural appropriation, I think it's also important to keep in mind that it's, it's, it's a complex issue as Professor Karamura said, it's not always clear cut. And then, of course, to finish up this timeline of highlights of cultural appropriation that have existed throughout the last two um, centuries, um, we've had Miley Cyrus 
twerking to Robin Thicke's Bird Lines, which borrowed very, very generously from Marvin Gaye's Got to Give It Up. We have a Celia Banks accusing the Australian Iggy Celia of racial drag throughout most of the 2010s. We have something that has been puzzling me for a very, very, very long time that no one has ever called them out, but we have Sasha Baron Cohen who is refusing to give up on this Ka uh, Kazakhstan caricature Borat and who has released the Borat 2 movie, um, yet he has mostly managed to escape uh, claims of cultural appropriation for some reason. Um, and then recently we have Adele fans, uh, particularly in the UK, um, actually feeling very conflicted because they love Adele and they feel that she's uh, honestly respecting um, British, um, Black culture, but she also posted a recent Instagram photo in which she is seen with a Bantu knot hairstyle and wearing a Jamaica flag bikini in celebration of Nottingham Carnival. So what these examples illustrate is that culture has always been an important element of um, ethnic group social and political identities. That's always been the case. And it also illustrates that there have always been concerns about the exploitation and misrepresentation and about the misuse of especially uh, systemically oppressed groups' cultures um, in entertainment. Um, and it might be more visible now because of social media, but it's not necessarily unique to the 21st century, but it's still extremely important, right? At least now people have a voice to voice their concern. What I think is unique to particularly sociological studies of cultural appropriation and entertainment is something that is not surprising, but it's interesting, is the Eurocentric focus of most of these concerns. And I don't mean that in a negative way. So let me explain that. Um, so while we're reviewing most of the academic and non-academic studies and articles and social media commentaries on cultural appropriation, um, I found that the majority of those commentaries and studies and articles focus on the West one way or another. Um, and as I said, it's not surprising because the concept ultimately originated in the West. Um, one of the first people that mentioned uh, cultural colonialism, for instance, was Kenneth Coote Smith in 1976. Um, and it was used in the context of um, post-colonialism. It was a criticism of um, Western um, cultural imperialism. So it makes sense that it does focus on Western culture. But if you focus on current debates um, on cultural appropriation in entertainment in particular, um, we can see that the commodification and appropriation of culture does not just take place in a Western context, um, but it also takes place within non-Western cross-cultural context where non-Western cultures appropriate other non-Western cultures. And we don't read that much about those kind of study, uh, about those kind of um, cases. So um, for instance, since 2009, uh, at the beginning of the second Korean wave, uh, Western scholars have increasingly began to focus on the K-pop industry um, and um, they started to look at, for instance, the K-pop music industry's ties to U.S. and Japanese pop culture and its reliance on digital communication technology. Um, and because of all of those different um, um, dynamics, they argue uh, that K-pop music in itself is a hybrid product. Um, and uh, just to cut a long story short, they will say um, it, it's uh, prone to borrowing from music um, but is also therefore prone to claims of um, cultural appropriation simply because of the nature of the K-pop construct. It, it's a hybrid product, so it's made up of various components from different cultures, uh, and that's a completely different story. Um, but because it doesn't necessarily always credit the sources that it uses, um, it, it, it can clumsily borrow from different cultures. Um, it's not alone in that, as I mentioned before, um, in, in the early 2000s, um, uh, hip hop for a very long time, uh, liber very liberally borrowed from Bollywood and Bhangra uh, and didn't always uh, credit uh, um, 
South, uh, South Asian music influences or the British Bhangra community, um, they changed their ways, they ultimately did, but it was a learning process. Um, and it seems that the K-pop industry, especially now it's grown and become much more popular is still in that process. For instance, most recently, um, uh, Blackpink was called out for featuring uh, a random sculpture of the deity Ganesha in their video, How You Like That. Um, and NCT um, a couple of days ago or a week ago um, caused some controversy for performing on a Korean music show, Inkigayo. Uh, and then in the back of their performance, uh, there was actually a visual of the Iman Hussein shrine in Karbala, Iraq. And there were some Islamic prayer texts displayed behind them, which in itself could potentially be okay if there was a connection to the song. But the song was called Make a Wish. And the lyrics, which I freely translated into English, um, translate to something like, I can do this all day, back it up, back it up, hurry, hit that line, it's a waste of time. I don't need no more sign. Yeah, where you were, I can find it. Yeah, so there was no connection and it caused some controversy, um, obviously among fans who were offended by uh, the religious Im imagery behind them. Um, and so it's interesting that few Western scholars at least um, are focusing on cultural industries uh, in the non-West and how cultural industries in the non-West are perhaps appropriating um, cultures from that are also non-Western. Now, and I'll make sure that I remain in the time frame because I noticed I have four, five, four more minutes left. Um, one thing that I did, uh, and to summarize it, is focus on my home country of the Netherlands, where I grew up. Because to be really honest, um, when we focus on cultural appropriation, and I talk to my relatives and friends and colleagues in the Netherlands, um, in terms of entertainment, it's very, very rarely talked about. Um, which is interesting because they almost pretend like it doesn't exist in the Netherlands, that like we don't have cultural appropriation in the Netherlands. And growing up in the Netherlands, I thought that is really not the case because I remember distinctly of uh, many, many, many really bad racial stereotypes in Dutch entertainment. Um, and I just put up some pictures that you can see here. Um, starting in the 1950s, these were the representations of Native Americans that we saw. Well, not we, I, was, I wasn't there yet in the 1950s, but that were presented to us. Um, Joanne Franca, uh, this was in 2012, um, uh, so not that long ago that she represented the Netherlands at this huge platform at the Eurovision Song Contest. And Ushi and Dushi, um, and this is the most amazing part that uh, Wendy van Dijk is the most or one of the most popular presenters, actresses in the Netherlands. This was one of the most popular shows in the Netherlands for up till two years ago. And she would actually interview Asian and African-American celebrities um, dressed up in yellow face and yellow suit and black face and black suits like those characters. And no one thought that there was anything wrong with it um, up until I would say about two years ago, very interestingly, um, when the Black Lives Matter movement also crossed over into um, the Netherlands. And um, I put some other examples here. Um, Femke Louise, um, who was influenced um, by what they called the black fishing, um, which also happens here in the US, but uh, she kind of cashed in on this whole trend of um, her song was called uh, on, on My Money. Um, but when it comes to um, the Black Lives Matter movement, if for some reason it's very interesting that Black Lives Matter cultural appropriation are kind of categorized in the same way. They feel that uh, it's part of American cultural imperialism. Um, that discussions about, for instance, uh, blackface and black Pete, uh, black Pete and Sinterklaas, which you see on the right, um, which has been very lively. Um, I don't probably you've heard of it. It's been discussed even on the level of the United Nations at uh, the European Court of Justice as a, a human rights violation. Um, and the Dutch are very resistant to letting go of this very racist tradition because they feel it's part of their um, 
Dutch heritage, um, it's been reframed in terms of blackface. And people that resist the term blackface also resist the terms cultural appropriation, arguing that um, we don't we don't have blackface. Blackface is something that is American. Blackface is something that's related to U.S. history. And they will point at studies done in the Netherlands on cultural appropriation, which, um, and I have to admit, which is very interesting, they don't use Dutch examples on cultural appropriation. All the studies done on cultural appropriation in the Netherlands in entertainment use the exact same examples that Professor Karamura discussed. Um, there are a few uh, exceptions, which are studies done by um, Annika Smel uh, Smelik, for instance, and they focus on Dutch wax fabric, um, Flisco Dutch wax, and fashion. But otherwise, they all focus on Native American exploitation in America. They focus on fashion designers exploiting corn ropes and dreadlocks. Um, but there's nothing said about um, the Dutch entertainment industry uh, appropriating um, other cultures. And it's very interesting that um, cultural appropriation in that regard is seen uh, as kind of the consequence of the Black Lives Matter movement. And even, and, and we don't have time to discuss it any further, but even as a consequence of uh, K-pop fandom, because in recent, uh, particularly this year, K-pop fandom has expanded its political influence as well. And uh, that has been part of discussions in the Netherlands as well, that uh, most of the people involved in discussions about cultural appropriation have been K-pop fans uh, in the Netherlands. So um, it's, it's been a very, it's, it's very interesting to look at cultural appropriation from um, non-North American or non British perspectives, because um, you get a different understanding. Um, in terms of non-Western societies appropriating non-Western cultures, there's not a lot there. But in the Netherlands, there's, it, it's mostly framed within a North American context. And um, that left me with even more questions than when I started looking into it. So mm -hmm. uh, I apologize. I went over my time. So uh, and um, I guess see if there's still any any questions. I yes, see. thank you so much. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I tried to. Um, oh no, it's great. I mean, we are we are a couple minutes over the time uh, slot, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask now, if you have time. Um, I had, well, not a question, but hi, Mark. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks. <laughs> for really great chat. Um, just I was was really interested in it, especially considering different international perspectives on it, how different their views are from our own. But I was just reminded this morning, there was just an article that came out about Cardi B. And um, so if you just Google Cardi B Hindu goddess, there is a, a controversy that just came out this morning that she was doing an ad for footwear and the stylists of the photo, the creative team in the photo shoot dressed her up as a Hindu goddess. Um, which is obviously problematic, especially when you're using it to sell shoes. Um, so I just thought I'd point that out if anyone wanted to um, read more about that. I'll put the link in the chat. The, the, Could you please repeat the name, please, of the author of the study of the Dutch wax print, please? I'd like to follow up on that study. Oh, yes, it's um, An Annika Smelik. Um, I, I, maybe I should... Uh, Type it in. It's a, a her last name is S M E L I K, Smelik. Okay, and do you know where that was published? Oh, I think uh, Professor Karamura will know. It's in a a, a fashion journal. Um, okay, thank you. Yes, I I think with the what you said about the um, Cardi B. Um, in one of my classes, we talked about um, shoes and um, athletic wear um, that features uh, Ganesha as well. And I thought it's so interesting. Um, we wanted to figure out who is making it. Is it targeted towards certain groups or are, are, are who is allowed to wear it? So we had all these questions that we weren't sure who, who you know how to answer it. So it's, it's fascinating, right? OK. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, yeah, the use of Hindu goddess and gods and goddesses has always been a problem and controversial. 
um, some brands put, you know, God's image on like underwear or bikinis and stuff like that, swimwear. And it was, that was also controversial. And putting them on, on footwear near the ground is also always controversial, as you said. But that story that you mentioned is very interesting. I'll look into it. You're Molly, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Yumi. Yeah. Sure. Would anyone else like to ask a question? Someone Others? had asked, asked for the name of the author, 1976 author of the Cultural Appropriation and Post-Colonialism Study, and that would be great to have that reference as well. Thank you. Did you oh. hear that, Mark? Yes, uh, Kenneth Coutts, uh, C-O-U-T-T-S, Smith. S-M-I-T-H? S-M-I-T-H, yes. Okay, okay, great. Well, um, I, if there are no more questions, um, I would just really like to thank you both. Um, it was a fascinating talk, um, just so interesting. And if anyone would, would like to follow up with you, I'm, I'm sure that they'd, they'd be able to, right? Um, if they had any other questions. Okay, thank you again so much for, to everybody for coming and for supporting this, this program. Thanks again. Thank you, Helen. Okay. Thank you for all I hope you enjoy Tokyo Uni. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Okay. Thank Bye, you everybody. Ever. Thank you so Bye. much.